أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا بني يذهبوا فتحسسوا من يوسف وأخيه ولا تيأسوا من روح الله إنه لا ييأس من روح الله إلا القوم الكافرون رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Mabad everyone, once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. So tonight I try to cover with you uh, some things I've come to learn about ayah number 87 of Surah Yusuf. This is a surah which kind of represents a contrast from what we've been reading thus far. Um, we saw a pretty heated and a pretty intense exchange between um, uh, the sons of Yaqub alayhi salam and himself where he drew a boundary and I talked about that at length yesterday. Uh, this entire exchange begins in ayah number 84. So in ayah number 84, uh, you know, when they gave their story to him, he responded to them, Sabrun Jamil, Asallahu an yatiani bihim jamia. Maybe Allah will bring them all to me. And then in the next ayah, his grief overtook him. Fatawalla anhum, fatawalla anhum asafa ala Yusuf. We talked about that. Then they lost their cool and they started, you know, having uh, an outburst against him. In which they said, Tallahi tafqalu tallahi tafta'u tathkuru Yusuf hatta takuna haradan aw takuna mil halikin. And he responded, what we read about yesterday, qala inna ma ashku bathi wa huzni ilallah. So it seems like he started with this, this conversation, and hopefully Allah will bring you know all my family back. But then his grief took over. Then they had a heated exchange, and then he walked away from them. And he said, just and when you're yelling at me, don't, because I'm only talking to Allah, not you, basically. Right, there's a lot more to it that we've already talked about yesterday, but now it seems like, you know, he's distanced himself from, you know, the, his, his sons who've hurt him so badly, and he's he can only really talk about his pain to Allah. But in this ayah, we see that he turns back to his sons, so he, he they've got a moment where they part ways. And he literally turned away from them, and they're not on good terms, or that that conversation didn't end well. Clearly. But he's still their dad And he's still going to give them advice And you may have tough conversations with family But that doesn't mean that I'm no longer your dad And you're no longer my kids I'm still going to tell you what needs to, be, what needs to be said Right? So now he's going to come back and speak to them And interestingly, he's going to speak to them lovingly So let's read a, you know, a, a basic translation of uh, this ayah And then we'll dive deeper into some of its profound wisdom Ya bani yadhabu fatahassasu min Yusufa wa akhihi. My sons, go and seek out, find any clue you can regarding Yusuf and his brother. Walatay asu min rohillah, and don't lose hope in Allah's loving, Allah's mercy, and Allah's relief, the relief that Allah will bring. Inna hu la yai asu min rohillahi illa alqawmul kafirun. It is, it is in fact the truth that. None but those who disbelieve are actually hopeless in Allah's mercy or Allah's relief. Okay, so this statement about Allah's relief and even before then, go look for Yusuf and his brothers. It's quite a few things that need a bit of analysis. So the first thing is this may not have happened immediately after. It may have happened moments later or hours later or the next day or something like that because one conversation clearly suggests that he's not talking to them and he's walking away from them, right? But the Qur'an has these scenic transitions. And this transition is pretty important contrast because, like I said in my introduction, even though he's had a conversation with them in which he had to say, I'm not talking to you because they were being abusive and unsupportive, right? But now he's still coming back and talking to them and speaking with them very directly and actually even speaking to them lovingly. So before we concern ourselves with the content of what he says, because the, the content of what he says is obviously critical. But the term in the beginning, Ya Baniya, my beloved sons, is actually an add-on. Because you can speak to your sons without saying, my sons. You can just say, go, find Yusuf and his brother. There's nobody else to talk to. Obviously, they're the audience. And if you're reading Quran and you hear, go, he said, go. Then obviously you're not going to think he went to the neighbors and talked to them to go. He's talking to his sons. But the add of the adding of the words Ya Baniya, my sons, a proclamation. You see, for a for a child to hear the word son or my son or my baby or my boy, etc. These are all terms of endearment. 
right? And they, they're not, and they're especially terms of endearment when you could use their names or you could just say, listen up. But when you use their names, and especially instead of a name, you refer to the relationship, that's actually a heart softener. It's meant to make the child feel closer to the father. So while they were angry at him, he's going to say something, but the way in which he says it is still loving. And that's clear from the word Yabaniya. He still, still spoke lovingly. This itself is a powerful lesson. This itself is critical to note. Sometimes people will treat you in family. Sometimes people will deal with you in ways you don't deserve. But that doesn't change who you are and the way you carry yourself. So yes, you can draw a boundary. You can say, you're not going to talk to me about this, this, and this. Or I'm not engaging in this conversation or that conversation with you. But the way in which you speak to them, because they're family and they deserve love still, they deserve respect still, you won't cross that line. And actually, he's the parent. The parent has the right to lash out and do other things. The, Allah doesn't say about to parents, don't be harsh to your kids. He says to children, you know, to children, don't be harsh to your parents. It's the other way around. You know, la taqullahuma uffin. But even as a father, he recognizes that he is going to be loving towards them. And what that means is you will find yourself in situations where your children, for example, are disrespectful to you. You'll find yourself in that situation. You still have to be who you are as a dad or a mom. You're, you can draw that line and say you're crossing a line. You can be disciplinary. You can even scold at times. But when they need loving advice, you will still give loving advice. Parents will not, or family will not. If you're a believer, you won't hold a grudge and say, well, other things that I was otherwise going to give you, the rights I was going to give you, I will now deprive you of. No, honest conversation and speaking what needs to be said to your children or to other family members still needs to be said whether you had a fight or not. The truth is still the truth. What has to be said still has to be said. That's This is a problem because for a lot of us, when we are in conflict situations, we want to run from that conflict situation, not engage in it. Or if we engage in it, our emotions get riled up and we speak in ways that isn't loving or isn't really the best way of communicating with anyone. We wouldn't want to be communicated with that way and we're communicating that way ourselves. But we're learning, the, to, you know, not take the higher road, take, take the road of sabr, meaning stay the same. You don't budge from your principles. You know what the manners of speaking are. You know how you're supposed to carry yourself. You stay constant. And you know what happens sometimes? The people that you're talking to, his sons have disrespected him and disobeyed him and you know, been dishonest to him and hurt him in the most vile, horrible way and have denied it and got mad at him instead for so many years. So the question naturally arises, why would they deserve this kind of kindness from him? They don't deserve it. The thing is, with, human, with family, we don't know when Allah will turn their hearts. We don't know when a kid that's acting up against you when they're a teenager is going to come to their senses five years later and say, I'm sorry about the way I was. I have non-Muslim friends who know nothing about religion, know nothing about Islam, whatever little they know about Islam is from me. And they'll tell me when I was a, when I was a kid, man, I gave my dad a hard time. Every time I see him, every Christmas that I see him or every holiday I see him, I say, man, I'm sorry of the way I was to you. Like... Even, even a non-Muslim child with, with no spiritual inclination can grow up and later realize I wasn't good to him or I wasn't good to her, right? So, but you don't want to leave them with the memory that when I wasn't good to you, you were bad to me also. Because they won't remember then what they did wrong. They will only remember the part that hurt them, what you did wrong. You stay your constant. They, they raise their voice. They use bad words. They use some, something or the other. While you don't allow them to trample over you, you don't cross your ethical lines either. You stay principled. What they will remember is dad always spoke respectfully. Dad always said my doors are open. Dad always gave us good advice. He never got mad. And even when he got mad, he spoke in a way that we've never seen anybody else get mad. Other people get mad. They lose their, they lose their temper. They lose their manners. He didn't lose his manners. He didn't use bad words. She didn't say this. She didn't say that. That's Yaqub alayhi salam with Yabaniya. Because after that kind of an exchange, why would you want to have a loving conversation? Because I'm the father still. Because that's my job. That's what I have to be for them. Even as they've grown up and they have families of their own. That's the other remarkable thing. They're not kids anymore. 
they were already young men when the story started. Now they're older men and they have their entire families with them. How do we know that? When Amiru Ahlana in the Quran, earlier on the surah, remember they said, we're going to go back, get loads of camel food on our camels. Why? Because we're going to feed our families. So they're all married and they're adults now. But at the end of the day, even when they're adults, you're still their parent. And even if your job is not to protect them and to raise them anymore, your job is still to give them good counsel when there's an opportunity to. And so that's inside Yabaniya. He says, Idhabu, go. All of you go. Fatahassasu min Yusufa wa akhihi. So now first, for the first time, Yaqub alayhi salam is encouraging them to go. <laughs> but also because there's nobody to protect now. They're the ones that you needed protection from, right? The ones that's, that are left of them. Now, keep in mind, three sons are missing, right? So what does he say? فَتَحَسَّسُ Then seek out or look for any clues for the hassasa comes from his in Arabic. His has to do with sensitivity or the senses. So when you're looking for clues, like if, if, uh, you know, uh, if you're smelling something and you follow the smell to the chicken that's being cooked, that you use your his to do that. Sounds, you follow the sound and you made it to a conversation that's happening That's using his sight clues, you know, trackers in the woods and things like that They see a broken leaf or they see tracks and they follow the tracks That's also using, that's the hasus also And early scholars would make a distinction between the root letters Jim, seen, seen, and ha, seen, seen So jas and his, right? So tajassus and tahassus Tajassus means to spy on somebody and tahassus means to seek out somebody. And they're very close in meaning because the only difference they mark is like Alusi and Ibn Ashur in their commentaries that when you are looking for someone, looking for something secretly, you're doing tajassus, which becomes spying, right? You're looking for something, but you're looking about it, going about it secretly. But if you're openly looking for something and you're actively seeking it out, then you're doing tahassus. So he says, go do tahassus. Go do this investigation and Look at and, and any clue you can find in regards to Yusuf and his brother. This conversation actually wasn't about Yusuf. In fact, the last thing we saw, the la last mention of Yusuf we saw, was they lost their temper when he even said, Oh, what my sorrow over Yusuf. The sadness I still feel for Yusuf. Those words made them angry, remember? And now he's turning around and saying, Go look for Yusuf? How come? This is an important riddle to solve. Ibn Ashur rahimahullah is a brilliant response to this. I was thinking this anyway, and then when I read this from Ibn Ashur and Sheikh Suhaib shared it with me too, I was like, spot on. That's exactly what I was thinking. You know what it is? When they came back so many years ago with a shirt that was riddled with blood, animal blood, Damin Kadib, and they lied to him about Yusuf's been killed and eaten by a wolf, right? When they told that story, I anal when we analyzed those ayat, I sh shared with you that Yaqub didn't buy it. He didn't accept their version. But no matter what he said, that he doesn't believe them, and you're making up a lie, they were committed to their lie. He died, dad, what do you want us to say? He died, okay? Just get over it, he died. Enough. I can't keep repeating this. It hurts us to talk about it. Right? So they remained committed on the lie and he couldn't bring it up anymore because even if he did it would be the same relentless response from them he died he died he died he died he died but in his heart even though that conversation has been beaten into silence he's been forced into silence in that com with that conversation he can't bring it up with them they shut it down every time it happens even though that's the case all these years in his silence what are they pretending they're pretending he bought our version. He accepted our version. What's the reality inside of his heart that he's been swallowing? I have never accepted your version. I have known it's a lie all along. I have known it's a lie all along. And when they lost their temper over the mention of who? Yusuf. The genius of Yaqub salam is, he knew now that this what they did with him is still bothering them, which is why the mention of his name still bothers them. It's like the guilty conscience is coming out in strange ways. And their anger towards, why are you going to keep mentioning Yusuf? Are you going to kill yourself? Stop talking about Yusuf. That when they did that, they kind of gave away their guilt even further. But there's also a difference. This time when they came with the story of missing Binyamin, they in fact told the truth. 
So Yaqub is also noticing a difference. There's a glimmer of hope in these young men now. They're actually being honest with me. I'm upset that I lost my son, bin Yamin, but there is some change in them. They're not giving me some wolf Adam story. They're even saying, corroborate our story and verify what we're saying. You can ask the rest of the caravan, anybody else. They're going to tell you what we're telling you. This is what happened. Right? Like, ask the entire town that we went to. Ask anybody in that town. Or ask the caravan that we traveled with. There was a lot of people. All of them saw this incident. It's not just us. So now he knows that they're actually being honest with him. Well, if they're being honest with him, it's as if either, and there are two possibilities for what I'm about to say, either Allah revealed to him that this is the time that you no longer have to swallow anymore, you can speak up. You need to speak your truth now. This is the time. Or he came to the conclusion using his own wisdom that this is the time the iron is hot, they're actually feeling guilty for a change. For what they've done instead of making up lies they're actually guilty that they lost a brother and they're trying to make things right this is the time that maybe i can get them to try to make things right over the other wrong they've been burying all this time so what does he do he doesn't say go look for your brother or go find clues what happened to your brother he says go look for yusuf and his brother so he even before bin yamin who did he put Yusuf Salam, which immediately let them know, oh, you never bought it? Wait, you never believed our story? You're still... And even we just, we just told you to not bring it up again, right? We got mad at you? But you're... St and that, get them getting mad like that, it wasn't uh, actual anger. It was a defense mechanism. Because for some people, when they do something horrible, they can't stand having a conversation about it, being confronted about what they did. They can't stand it. If you even try to bring it up a little bit, they're like, what did you say? Oh yeah? And they'll get so mad at you that you'll get scared to ever bring that topic up. You understand that? But you know what that is? That's a defense mechanism of theirs. They can't have that conversation because they're scared of that conversation. So their way of dealing with that, the best defense is offense, right? So their way of not dealing with that conversation is demonstrate so much frustration and anger that you don't even dare bring it up. Because if you see through that drama of them being angry and you actually, you know, you, you uh, uh, stress on bringing it up, you say, no, 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 we're going to talk about this. You can get mad. We're still talking about it then their, their, their fake defense is going to break. And you might, you might even find a real consciousness inside that they've been, hide, they've been running from, from themselves. Yaqub salam sees a golden opportunity. Let me tell you, by, by, you know, this idea of putting up a tough facade, right, a tough act, and inside it is someone very shallow, very, very vulnerable, uh, you know, very guilty. That's actually a really real thing. You, you might find, for example, teenagers that act really tough. They talk really big. They use terrible words. What are you going to do? Huh? And they'll raise their voice. And if you can stay relentless, after a couple of minutes of nothing bothers me, whatever, I don't care. After that, I don't care, whatever, it's going to crack and you're going to see someone bawling in tears. Breaking, because you broke through. Yaqub alayhi salam in his wisdom is now approaching them with love. Right? And, and lovingly, this time he's not saying, I'm only talking to Allah. No, I'm talking to you. You're my sons. My sons, I need you to be sensitive and looking for any clue you can for Yusuf and his brother. <laughs> the word sensitivity is also a subtle duality. It may not be a direct implication of the text, but certainly Allah chooses words in the Quran that are that have these, these flavors. Right? To, to, to look for someone and to discover someone or to scope out a territory, istikshaf. And there are other words you can say, ibhathu an Yusuf wakhi, look for Yusuf and his brother. But the hassasu from his actually also means to have sensitivity or to be delicate. And part of the subtle implications is not just look for clues, ask people, try to find a trace of Yusuf, not to mention his brother, but also means find somewhere in you sensitivity towards Yusuf and his brothers.
Like it's the, the layer of meaning inside that same verb isn't just look for him, but find feeling towards them. Feel something for them. You know, you feel guilty already a little bit. I know it. Just stop running away from that feeling and confront it. They did deserve some feeling from you. Now the question is, you know, if, if you look at the, the rest of this ayah without this analysis, you, you come to a certain kind of a, 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 a confusion. Because he's talking to sons that have been angry at him, they've been yelling at him, they've done this horrible thing, right, in, in their past and never admitted it and actually were adamant about it too. And not to mention, I, I, I keep talking about this over and over, because it, these, these pylons should be mentioned. When Binyamin got you know, accused of stealing, they dragged Yusuf's name under the mud anyway, when they got the for no reason, because the grudge is still there, right? We talked about that. So they've been harboring a lot of negativity towards Yusuf alayhi salam. And even as they have, maybe some part of them does feel guilty. They're not shayateen, they're human beings. They're not devils. When human beings do something wrong, somewhere inside them, something says, this is not okay. What I'm doing isn't right. I need to make a change. Your conscience will poke you. Somewhere in there, your conscience will poke you. And especially for a Muslim. For a Muslim, they know what Allah wants. They know what the, this deen teaches. They know they have to stand in front of Allah eventually. And no matter how far they run into sin, somewhere inside them, there's a voice, even though that voice is being choked to death, that voice is still there saying, stop, save me. I'm your soul in here somewhere. <laughs> Just let me, let me breathe. Because we're suffocating our spiritual self, our soul, our ruh, when we're doing that. We're not just running away from our guilt. We're running away from our conscience, our, 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 our standard of good and evil, the, 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 the thermometer for good and evil that Allah put inside us, that gauge. We're running away from it. We don't want to deal with it. What are the words of Yaqub to his sons that just yelled at him? First of all, he sees through their yelling and sees there's a guilty conscience in there somewhere. And maybe this is a time because they were even honest now and they are concerned. Well, if they're concerned about one brother, maybe something in them will wake up and they'll say, if I we're worried about one, maybe we should be worried about the other two. And don't lose hope from the mercy of Allah, the relief given by Allah. I'll, we'll go into the etymology of ruh in a minute. But uh, why tell them to be to have hope? They're not the ones that are hopeless. There's lots of things to consider here. One, one consideration is, Dad, we talked to the governor. We talked to the Aziz. We tried to convince him to take one of us in his place. There was no way he would listen to us. Who are they talking about now? Yusuf. They don't know that, but they're talking about Yusuf. And they said there's no hope with him. The guy was completely adamant that he will not be, let Binyamin go. There's no way we can get around that, Dad. And the words in the Quran earlier were, minhu." When they finally reached the state where they had no hope of recovering him, najiyah, they went silently and had their own meeting. Right? So, istay'asu, when they lost complete hope. Dad, you're sending us into a hopeless situation. Even if we go out there, we already tried everything you're saying. How are we going to get Yusuf and his brother back? Well, first of all, Yusuf, how? And you guys know, right? Um, nowadays, police departments, they have like a missing persons department or a few detectives that are assigned for missing persons. When people report a person missing, they say, well, you have to find them within the first 48 hours or 72 hours or whatever, how many hours. And, then, and every day, every hour after that, the chances of them being found start statistically dropping. So if somebody's been missing for a year, the chances of them being found become slim to none. Ten years, most likely they're dead, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So there's, because they follow all these cases, so they have all these statistics, right? So they say, well, now there's a 0.00001% chance of him being alive. Well, Yusuf's been gone a long time, right? So what's the most likely scenario? The most likely scenario is you shouldn't have hope that he's going to come back. That this missing person's report is way too old. It's a really cold case. It's gone. Right, So in that, what I'm trying to get at is their response would be, it's hopeless to find Yusuf and it's hopeless to find Binyamin. Because we tried with Binyamin, it's, how do we take on a government? How are we going to take on the president or the VP of the country 
and get him to give us Yusuf when we were standing in front of him begging and he wouldn't listen to us? Why would he give him up now? And in response to that thought process, preempting that thought process, meaning before you even get to say this, let me tell you, I know you're thinking this. And let me respond to your thoughts without you even expressing your thoughts. And that's what a parent knows, right? They know how a child thinks. When you have real family, when you have real loved ones, they know how you think. And this is teaching us, we should understand how our family members, even the ones we don't get along with, how they think. And what we say should actually already take into account their thought process. What did he say to them? You can have no hope in your ability to do investigative you know, inquiry. You can have no hope in the government. You can have no hope in the governor of Egypt. Fine, have no hope in any of them. But don't lose hope in Allah's mercy. Allah is the one who created these means and Allah can create entirely new means. Allah is the one who created this scenario. Allah can create entirely other scenarios. He can make the sky you know, the way, uh, uh, held up every day. He can make the sun rise from the east and go down in the west and he can turn that in reverse one day. He can, you're the children of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When he wants, he can make a fire cold. When he wants, he can make a knife refuse to cut. When he wants, he can make water come out of the desert. When Allah wants to give relief, he gives relief. You are, and this is not thousands of years of history for you. This is your grandpa, Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's your grandfather. So you should be the first to know that we, we, our family, we never lose hope in the relief coming from Allah. We're not those people. <laughs> so he says, إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُ مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ The only people who lose, the, the fact is, nobody loses hope in Allah's mercy except, or nobody has hope in Allah's mercy except disbelieving people. What does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, you know, most interpretations are, well, if you don't have hope in Allah, you'll be like who? Disbelievers, but actually the contrast is 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 more even more valid. What what's the contrast? The contrast is disbelievers, people who don't have Allah in their life, have no hope of Allah giving them relief because they never ask Allah for it. Why would they want? To, why would they get relief from Allah Azza wa Jalla? But you and I, we're not like them. We're believers. We have Allah in our lives. We have the source of all hope. And all relief. The one who gives relief to my lungs every time I inhale and every time I exhale. He's not going to give relief when I ask him. I should have, I should expect that he won't do that. You know, we take what Allah does for us on a daily basis for granted. The world is now shaken by a virus. How many millions of bacteria, trillions of bacteria are floating inside our bodies? How many unknown viruses are right now in this room? How many unseen killers are around me that Allah has sent legions of angels to protect me from miraculously? And I have no knowledge of you know, how this is functioning. If I was in charge of the maintenance of my lungs <laughs> or the cleaning up of my arteries, if I was in charge of that, then I'd be dead a long time ago. He's the one making the heart beat. He's making, he's making the eyes wet so they can continue to see. He's making the earlobes function. He's making every neuron fire in this brain. Otherwise, this is a dead piece of organic matter. That's all this is. But there's a miracle happening in the fact that we're alive right now. That's the that's a believer's view of Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, I, I used to say a long time ago in my lectures, I believe it was Tariq Suidan who said it in one of his lectures. I heard it and I was like, wow, that's a pretty epic example. He said, I want you to imagine a person from the time they were born until they were like 20 years old, they lived in a, in, a, in a house with no windows. They could never leave that house. There's no, they can't see outside, ever. And 20 years later, they're let out in the middle of the day. And they look at the sun. What's their reaction? You guys see that? Oh my God, it's huge. It's lighting up everything. And everybody's like, are you crazy? The sun? You know why it's so normal to us? Why the sun is so normal? Because we see it every day. We take it for granted because we see it every day. <laughs> the sky, the breeze, the clouds. We see these things every day. So they're just uh, nothing. Are they nothing? Just contemplate what they are. 
uh, and how Allah has produced life on this earth. How can someone contemplate what Allah has done for us and then not have hope in the relief that Allah will bring? The only people who will do that, the only people who never even consider having hope in Allah are people who don't know Allah. But you, you my sons, you know Allah. You know Him. You can't have that. And Allah will not give relief to those who never turn to Him. Not in the way that He will give a believer. So, and you're believers, you're fortunate. You have Allah. What's He doing? Remarkably, they used Allah's name in vain. Not a couple of ayat ago. When they yelled at Him about Him mentioning Yusuf, they mentioned Allah's name in the beginning. Swear to Allah. You're going to keep talking about Yusuf? That was a mis inappropriate use of Allah's name, wasn't it? But He's saying, even if you have a... Even if your iman is this little weak, even if you have no your your tongues can mention Allah's name, but your hearts don't shake when you say his name. Somewhere in there, somewhere in that heart that doesn't shake, there is still one cell in there that has iman in it. And that one cell will find mercy with Allah. Find hope in Allah. I know there's iman in you. It doesn't matter how cold you get, it doesn't matter how hard your hearts get, there's iman in you. And that iman should make you hopeful. But the question then arises, hopeful of what? You should say to Yusuf, you should be hopeful when you're in jail. You should say to Bin Yamin, you should be hopeful because you found your brother. Hopeful is for people who are in despair. They're not the ones in despair. They're perfectly fine. Actually, they're not all broken up about losing Bin Yamin, nor about losing Yusuf, are they? Not that much. So what do they need to hear about the mercy of Allah? Or not losing hope in the mercy of Allah? This is the deep insight from what I can tell of Yaqub alayhi salam into his sons. He's telling them, you don't confront your sin. And you don't confront what you've done with Yusuf. Because you think that if you do, you will come to a terrible conclusion about yourself. That you are monsters. That you're killers. That you're ruthless. That you're bloodthirsty. That you're evil, that you did something the devil would do. So you're horrible people. And he tells them, even though you just yelled at me and you're angry, that tells me you have guilt inside you. And that guilt means there's a goodness inside you that's still alive. Don't lose hope in Allah's mercy. Allah can, re Allah can restore you. He can redeem you. You messed up, sure. Go look for him. Go look for Yusuf and maybe that's a way you can redeem your soul. Don't lose hope in Allah's mercy, meaning if you do that, as you do that, you need to know that you, by you doing that, maybe Allah will you know, bring you back in His graces and you don't have to think that Allah has cast me off anyway. I'm a bad person anyway, right? So what do I do? What do I care? I don't want to think about it anymore. You know, there's an interesting bit of psychology when... Um, somebody is constantly guilted, right? Then they eventually shut off guilt. Because nobody wants to, because when you're made to feel guilty, you feel bad. Nobody wants to feel bad over and over and over again, right? So they get rid of the thing that makes them feel bad. Like if they were in a relationship where the, the father made them feel guilty for being a dropout of school all the time. This kid runs away from home because he doesn't want to feel shamed and guilted over and over and over again. I just couldn't take it. I ran away from home. That, that happens. It could be a, a, a marriage that breaks because one is constantly shaming and guilting the other. I can't take this anymore. I'm just, I'm done being blamed for everything. I'm done being criticized. I'm done being belittled. I, I just, I need to breathe. And people run from what? From guilt. And some people run from Allah's deen because of guilt. Some people say, well, every khutbah I went to, the khatibs keep saying, you're going to burn in hell, you're going to burn in hell, you're going to burn in hell. Okay, fine, I'm going to burn in hell. God, this is a negative religion. I just need to be positive. So I'm going to be around some friends who just want to smoke some weed and think happy thoughts and good, good vibes. So, uh, you know, I just want to be happy. So I just want to get away from this whole thing because it's too negative, man. It's just way too negative. I don't want to be around that kind of negativity. There's too much guilting and shame. Now I live without guilt. I feel good about what I do. You want to run away from guilt. You know, if guilt is caused by human beings, it's a bad thing. When Allah makes you guilty about something, it's because you should be guilty about it. And our religion isn't about beating people over the head with guilt. It's not. The Prophet ﷺ didn't used to shame people, even sinners. 
Even Yaqub is not shaming his sons over what they did. He's just saying, go look for him. But you know what? Sometimes people's guilt is so heavy inside of them that even if you're not beating it over their head and shaming them, they're shaming themselves so much inside themselves that they run from confronting Allah. They lose hope in Allah. They don't want to deal with Allah. And that's not something Allah did to them. That's not something some, somebody else did to them. That's something shaitan does to them inside of themselves that they, they, they just lose hope because they don't want to deal with the guilt. You see? So now here, when he says to them, don't lose hope in the, in the relief coming from Allah, in the redemption coming from Allah, rawhillah. Let's talk about the word rawh. Unique word in the Quran, rawhun wa rayhan wa jannatu na'im. Uh, rawh in Arabic actually is related to rih, which means wind. And rawh is breath. It's actually a synonym, a close synonym for nafas. Nafas in Arabic also means breath. And it's interesting that the word rawh, which means breath, or a breath of relief, technically a breath of relief, because from it you also get the word raha, which actually literally means relief. And in modern Arabic, they use istiraha for relaxation from the same origin of the word, right? So you know how we say in English literature, a breath of relief or a sigh of relief? Like, ha, ah, right? That's actually a rawh. A rawh. A, a, when someone's troubles are over and they can finally say, oh, you know, that's actually a rawh. It's really interesting in Islamic literature that the, the word rawh, Connected to it in the same etymology is the word ruh, ruh, which is the, the spirit of the human being, which was literally breathed into the human being, wasn't it? Nafaktu fihi min ruhi. And another another word for our inner self is called our nafs. You may have heard that word before, nafs, which comes from the other word nafas, which means breath. So the word nafs is related to nafas, which is breathing, and the word ruh is related to ruh, which is a sigh of relief. So this imagery and this theme of breathing is, has a lot to do with the, basically the essence of our life and the essence of our soul. Okay? There are other themes connected to it, but in a literary sense, these are things that circle each other, the, these terms. Anyhow, now that I've given you that, it's interesting from a literary point of view that Allah described the sadness of Yaqub a couple of ayat ago, and He said, فَهُوَ كَثِيمٌ Remember I said he was swallowing or choking up in sadness? Let me read something to you. قال ابن قتيبة About that ayah when he's فهو كظيم ابن قتيبة said وَيُجُوزُ أَنْ يَكُونَ بِمَعْنَ الْمَكْذُومُ وَمَعْنَهُ الْمَمْلُوءُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ مَعَ الصَّدِّ طَرِيقِ نَفْثَةِ الْمَصْدُورِ مِنْ كَظْمِ السِّقَاءِ إِذَا الشَّدَّ عَلَى مَلْئِهِ It actually means a, a, a kazim is someone who is having a hard time breathing a sigh of relief because their air passages passageways are being blocked or their chest has a lot of tightness somebody who claims that they have difficulty breathing like an asthma attack and they can't breathe easy right they're also called kadhim so the idea of kadhim is someone who's just not getting a relaxing breath they're not getting, they're not getting a break from from the you know the overwhelming terrible calamities that surround them and then Allah, he, that same Yaqub who was so overwhelmed that he couldn't breathe for such a long time is the same Yaqub from ayah number 84 is now turning around and saying to his sons don't lose hope in the sigh of relief that will come from Allah min rawhillah innahu la ya'isu min rawhillahi illa al-qawm al-kafir man the, the man who hasn't had a sigh of relief for decades is telling them Never lose hope that the relief is coming from Allah. And Hassan al-Basri actually, rahimahullah, among some other qurra, uh, uh, early on actually read this not as rawhillah, they read this as ruhillah. Now you know what ruh means, right? The ruh that Allah blew into, into us, the, the, the divine breath of Allah that was poured inside of the human being. And in that meaning it would be, don't lose hope in that soul that Allah has put inside you. Don't lose hope in that. It's got goodness in it. Don't give up on that goodness. I know that it's as if he's saying to them, Allah has put goodness in you that you should not give up on. And that's a very beautiful way of saying, I haven't given up on the goodness in you, even though you're terrible to me. There's a powerful statement that Yaqub makes. لا تيأسوا من روح الله 
By the way, when he let them know, all these years, by the way, I never believed your story about Yusuf. Why else would I tell you to go look for who? Yusuf, right? When he calls them out like this, and Allah already said that he's blind, right? Look at the irony in that statement. He's the one who's blind, and in this household, He's the only one who can see the truth. You see the irony? Sometimes people can have these eyes, but these eyes become blind. Right? Ta'mal absar, you know, you know, la ta'mal absar, the eyes don't become blind, but like in ta'mal qulub, the hearts become blind. Their eyes are fine, but their hearts are blinding. And his eyes are no good, but his eyes, his, his, his eyes are no good, but his heart can see clearly. He can see Yusuf. He can see the truth for what it is. He doesn't have to physically. He doesn't have to have the physical eyes to see that. That's an incredible thing that he sees it. So he says, "Go look for Yusuf and his brother because of that light that is inside him." And then the other thing that you know, some things that we should really pay attention to in these words. He it took a lot of boldness from him to mention Yusuf's name after they had yelled at him. And this is this is a lesson about confrontation. Right, because most of us we don't like confrontation. Now, some of us or some people you know love confrontation. They only feel important in life when they have some kind of drama, when they have some kind of confrontation. They need it to feel validated because they have nothing else to contribute in life. So they need confrontation to to feel like they exist. Right? Some people just they they need to cause pain or even feel pain to feel alive. It's a pretty sad state to be in. But most of us, we don't want confrontation. We just want to be at peace. We want to be in harmony. But sometimes you're dealing with a situation that requires confrontation. You need to do it. And sometimes you're dealing with someone, when you confront them, they explode on you. Didn't they explode on Yaqub? And the, the, the agenda behind exploding on you is what? To stop you from confronting. And most of the time it works. If somebody yells at you good, shames you good for even bringing it up. Oh yeah? You're going to talk about that? Oh, you should talk. And then they, then they, it turns on you. They turn on you and they start slamming you. And you're like, oh, I shouldn't have brought anything up. Well, what we're learning from Yaqub is when people, doesn't matter how upset they get, if they need to be confronted about something lovingly, you don't, you don't let your emotions and the way you carry yourself be affected by the way they're carrying themselves and you confront them lovingly anyway. Confrontation doesn't have to be aggressive. Confrontation can be loving too. It's like what they call now an intervention, right? That needs to happen. It doesn't have to be a fight. It doesn't have to be aggressive. It can actually start with words of love. It can actually bring about Allah and how there's hope. It can actually be filled with pos positivity. Yet these words are actually a confrontation because in these words, very clear, clear as day, I know what you did with Yusuf. It's, he didn't say it, but he said it. But he, without saying it, he said it. So he did confront them. And he didn't abandon that subject because they were losing their temper. You cannot allow someone else's upsetness to take you away from confrontation. If something needs to be said, that's why I call this session what needs to be said. If it needs to be said, find the courage and say it. But say it without losing your principles. Find it without, say it with love. Say it with respect. Say it with a lie in mind. Say it with a lie in your, genuinely, you know, a, a reference to Allah with genuine concern for yourself and for the other. When you say it with ikhlas, then it will work. You notice, after this ayah, they don't turn around to Yaqub and say, didn't we just say stop talking about Yusuf? Do I have to say it again? They don't say that. The next ayah, which we're going to study later, inshallah, is they left. You know what that means? It hit them. It actually hit them. Their, their, their guard and their aggressive guard broke. So when he came to them with love, sometimes what you couldn't get through with argument and yelling and you couldn't get through and some few loving words and they pierce right through, right? And maybe it's the mention of Allah in the way that they mentioned. 
that he mentioned to them. Maybe just the true dhikr of Allah for that moment. You know, when, when you could be as sinful as Fir'aun. But if the mention or the, the remembrance of Allah, just a little ray of light goes inside your heart, then it could be enough to shatter all the walls. It could be enough to bring you back. To bring you back to your fitrah. Because it doesn't matter if you're Fir'aun or you're you know, Hitler or whoever, or Donald Trump or whoever. It doesn't matter. One time, a long time ago, all of us were creatures made of light standing before Allah the Ruh. We're all in front of Allah. And we all said we worship only you. The worst sinners you see, the worst people on, in the world, were at one time swearing to Allah that they worship Him sincerely. They said this to Him. There's, there was a light inside them that Allah Himself put. He put it there. And so we have to be mindful of that and give advice with that in mind. You know, we talk to people with knowing that maybe that light, light will pierce through. How do I know? If Allah can change this dark sky at night into a brilliant morning, how can He not change the darkness inside somebody's heart? He could, Muqallibul Qulub, one of His names in the hadith of the Prophet, the one who changes transforms the hearts. He could, and that's all it takes, right? If somebody's heart is transformed, that's the only thing that will matter on Judgment Day. It won't matter what they did in the past. It, their mistakes won't matter because Tawbah does what to all those mistakes? It wipes them out. <laughs> but the other thing that I am just so in awe of when it comes to this statement from Yaqub is something that I was discussing with, um, with uh, uh, Sheikh Suhaib today. And that is that this episode of, his, of the story that's been recorded in the Quran here is clearly the darkest moments of Yaqub's life, alayhi salam. And it's the toughest time in his life. It's so, for a man who epitomizes sabr, he couldn't hold his tongue and cry out to Allah with his tongue. His heart was crying to Allah anyway. But he cried out. And the, like, for a person to reach that level of sadness, but you know what? For most of us, Sadness and hopelessness are married to each other. So sadness and hopelessness are always together. You know what's incredible about him? In the depths of his sadness, he took that sadness, and we'll show you the process. He took that sadness and he put it, he took this, whatever his heart was carrying, and he brought it in front of Allah. And he cried his heart out in front of who? Allah. And what did Allah give him? When he gave that sadness to Allah, Allah responds to him with filling his heart with so much hope that even though he's still sad, even though he's more broken than ever before, he is now more unbroken than ever before to the point where not only is he full of hope, he sees hope in everyone else too. You know, when you're negative, your world becomes negative. When you're angry, you find every reason to be angrier. When you feel like you're a bad person, you see the worst in everybody. When you are filled with hope, you fill others with hope. Whatever you have in your heart is contagious to your surroundings. Yaqub salam's heart was filled with sadness three ayat ago. Didn't we read that? And when someone's heart is filled with sadness and you're around them, your heart will be filled with sadness too, right? If you see somebody crying, broken, and you spend some time with them, you'll want to cry. You'll be heartbroken. But what? there's a difference between his sadness and every other sadness. His sadness was given to Allah as a treasure that only belongs to be presented in front of Allah. Here's what I bring to you, Ya Allah, this is what's in my heart. And Allah takes that and gives him this gift. This gift of what? Hope. And he will never lose hope in Allah. And he turns back and he tells his sons, look for Yusuf. Just now you said, oh, the tragedy of Yusuf. And a few moments later, look for Yusuf. Look for his brothers. Don't lose hope in Allah's mercy. 
Don't lose hope in the in the relief, the sigh of relief that will come from Allah. As if I haven't been able to breathe for a long time, but I know an exhale is coming. It's coming for you too. You'll be able to breathe. You'll be able to look at yourselves in the mirror. It's coming. إِنَّهُ لَا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ you, Im- you come out of the most painful circumstance and you emerge divinely inspired optimistic. Like an optimism that's not humanly possible. Except if Allah injects it. You know, there are some chemicals our body cannot produce. There are some, you know, medications. We need an injection from the outside for it to have an effect. Our body can't produce that medication on its own. And the same way there are some emotions our human nafs is not capable of. They have to come from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Their divine intervention. Like Allah says, فَأَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ عَلَى قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He sent tranquility onto the hearts. He, and He says, فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِمَانًا مَعَ إِمَانِهِمْ Oh, one of the most beautiful ayat in the Quran. He said, He sent down calmness deep into the hearts of believers so they can become more in their faith in addition to the faith they already have. لِيَزْدَادُوا إِمَانًا مَعَ إِمَانِي You already have iman, but the calm that Allah will bring you, your iman is at some other level. So you, you go from, I only take my complaints to Allah, which means I'm feeling negative, and I'm going to talk to Allah about it, to now being the source of positivity. In just a couple of ayat, you see this transformation? That transformation is incredible. It's so powerful. But even more powerful than that to me is where this conversation began and where it ends. When this conversation began, when they gave him that story and he couldn't believe what they, they're saying, you know what he said first? Maybe Allah will bring all of them back to me. We already read that. That was in ayah number 83. Maybe Allah will bring them all back to me. Was there already optimism? There's optimism, but your positivity, but because you're human, the circumstances can make you deeply sad and negative. Then we saw that downward spiral for Yaqub alayhi salam, and then Allah brings him back up and he's back in a state of hope again. You know, like the, the heart rate that goes up and down? It's like that with Yaqub alayhi salam. But he comes back so powerfully strong. And I word I, I absolutely love the word rawh, which you know I've been talking to you about as uh, as hope, right? This word is associated in this ayah with being a believer, right? Like we shouldn't be negative because. Disbelievers, they have no connection to Allah Therefore they have no one they can put all their hopes in We have Allah The source of all of our hopes I feel bad for who? The people who don't have this, Al-Kafirun Right? People who deny Allah People who are ungrateful I started thinking In this surah Al-Kafirun only occurs one more time One other time before this In the whole surah I mean, you would think Makkah and Quran Kafirs are gonna mention get mentioned a lot, right? You know where it was mentioned? When Yusuf alayhi salam was in prison and he was talking to those two inmates, right? And he was in one of the darkest places of his life, right? Now we have Yaqub in the darkest place of his life. There we had who? Yusuf in the darkest place of his life. And he said, I left a people who don't believe in Allah and they have their kafirun of the akhirah. Their kafirun. In other words, he held on and he then ta- started, in prison he started talking to him to his inmates, the cellmates, about how he is blessed from Allah because he's from the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's a favor Allah has done for, for us and he, that favor extends to all people. That's what he said inside that prison. In his darkness, he thanked Allah from not being of the kafirun. In his darkness, he says, thank Allah that I have hope because I'm not from the kafirun. Don't be like them. Like father, like son. It's so beautiful. The two times even this word is echoed, there's a similarity. There's, there, you know, like he make he has the same thought process as his father in a similar circumstance. And there he was giving that hope and optimism to inmates in prison who clearly have a criminal record. So they've done messed up things, but it's okay. You can come back to Allah. 
you can be redeemed. And here he is talking to criminals. They've done a crime against Yusuf <laughs> and their father, and they can redeem themselves. Don't be like the kafirun. Kafirun don't redeem themselves. You can redeem yourself. You can come back. This is a um, just a, a, such a beautiful episode in this surah. This entire exchange, which seemed like a very negative exchange, but we've reached the end of that exchange now. And this this contrast that I talked to you about, the the take what the last takeaway that I'd like to give you from this ayah is that Allah has taught us that you can be deeply sad and absolutely hopeful both at the same time. You can be both. And neither one of them takes away from your iman. In fact, your negativity will become sabr jameel. The negative feelings of your emotion will become beautiful patience. And then when you exhibit that beautiful patience, Allah will fill your heart with hope like no other. فَتَحَسَّسُوا مِنْ يُوسُفَ وَأَخِيهِ وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ there is one last comment from the Mufassirun that I failed to mention that I should mention. It seems some thought that because he's so positive, because he's so, how are you even bringing up Yusuf now? Right? It may be that because he knew that his sons, the 11 stars, the sun and the moon, are going to be doing sajda, that maybe he's already starting to put clues together. Maybe he maybe he doesn't know exactly if Yusuf is the governor, but somehow he sees Yusuf's presence. He can feel Yusuf's presence and what's going on. And maybe Allah is bringing us closer to the fulfillment of that dream. Because early on, Yusuf told him that dream, and he knew that dream is revelation, and he absolutely believes it's going to happen, right? So perhaps his optimism is coming from that knowledge also. Some have you know, mention that as an imp a possible interpretation of this ayah. I'll conclude with that. Barakallahu li walakum fil Quran al Hakim, wa nafa'ani wa iyakum bil ayati wa dhikr al Hakim. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.